I really enjoy this Bible study workshop by Ken Burks. And like our program on the Hub, it also is entitled The Journey. Introductory Remarks. It's important for us to understand that our Christian experience is a walk of faith into the invisible realms of the kingdom of God. Isn't that good? We have an invisible path that has been set before us that can only be entered by faith as we accept the fact that we are mere pilgrims in search of a city whose builder and maker is God. Psalm chapter 84 verse 5 says, Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. Point one, as Christians, our calling is that of a pilgrimage or a journey. Point two, Peter, one of the disciples of Jesus, refers to us as pilgrims in his first epistle. Point three, we have been called to be like our father Abraham, who traveled through this world by faith not knowing where he was going. Point four, he was a pilgrim looking for a city unknown to his natural eyes, a city whose builder and maker was God and only could be seen through his spiritual eyes. Point five, if we are to be like Abraham, we must focus on things that are above and not seen. And then point six says, by focusing on that which is above, the invisible realm of God's kingdom, we can become true and faithful sojourners or pilgrims. Second Corinthians chapter four and verse 18 says, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The Christian life is a journey into this invisible kingdom realm that has the potential of either being the most exciting and adventurous journey you will ever experience or the most boring and miserable experience. Listen to this testimony. I once heard someone say after receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit, all these years I've had just enough religion to make me miserable. <laughs> once his eyes were open to the power of the Holy Spirit within him, his life then became a great adventure. Many of God's people default to a dry spiritual experience. Unfortunately, it's true. Many of God's people default to a dry spiritual experience, not because they want or desire to, but lack the faith and vision to enter a path that is invisible to their natural eyes. Jesus said, narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. Few find it. When we default to an experience that is dry and void of true faith and adventure, we do not gain a compelling experience of authentic Christianity. So let's highlight this portion of our workbook and answer this question in our discussion time together. What does the author mean when he says, when we default to an experience that is dry and void of true faith, and adventure, 
we do not gain a compelling experience of authentic Christianity. Let's go on. We must ask ourselves, which path has my journey taken me on? It may be that you come to the conclusion that you have been pushing the default button rather than walking in true faith. If so, don't lose heart because God is with you and delights in revealing what authentic faith is. Our goal as pilgrims who are on a journey to the same city Abraham was looking for should be to discover the invisible path that will lead us there. As Abraham journeyed toward the city that was unknown to his natural eyes, his destiny and purpose opened up before him. God began to reveal the invisible path he had chosen for him to walk in. This is why Paul said, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. And that's from Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2. Let's look at keys to having our eyes opened to the invisible path. One of the great challenges of our Christian faith is the ability to see into this invisible kingdom realm that gives us the capacity to be led by the Spirit with the eyes of our understanding fully open as His Spirit reveals all that God has prepared for us. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. It says, But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Key number one, we must know God as he knows himself. One of life's greatest pursuits is that of discovering God in all of his glory and majesties, a, discover, a discovery that enables you to come to a deeper understanding and revelation of who God is. Psalm 145 in verse 3 says, Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. His greatness is beyond discovery. It will allow you to experience his wonderful attributes coming alive within your heart, resulting in a greater level of intimacy with him. Many of us have grown up with misconceptions of who God is, and as a result, we have been afraid of getting too close to him. So let's highlight this and let's discuss that. What is, are some of the misconceptions that you have had of God, do have now or have had in the past of God, and as a result that has made you afraid of getting too close to him? Many of our false perceptions of God have been based on how we may have viewed authority figures in our lives, including our fathers and mothers. We have a tendency to project onto God the unloving characteristics of the people who have influenced our lives to some degree. We must also consider that the world in which we live is under the sway and the influence of the enemy of our faith, Satan. Satan's goal is to give us an immensely distorted view of who God is so that we will have no affection or desire towards him. No wonder so many people have a distaste for God. The world needs to see the true characteristics of God 
through his church, which is the pillar and the ground of all truth. The truth is, how you perceive God will affect how you relate to them, to him. Again, the truth is, how you perceive God will affect how you relate to God. It is important to see and perceive God in the way in which he has revealed himself through his word because every aspect of his word is pure and equips us to be complete in him. As we give ourselves to the study of God's words and his divine attributes, we begin to see God as he is and how his attitude toward us is always favorable. A correct biblical view allows us to see and perceive God as a person who likes us and loves us no matter what we have done. The bottom line of how God genuinely thinks about each of us as individuals is that he has nothing but thoughts of peace with a desire to give us a future and hope. Jeremiah 29 11 tells us this saying for I know the thoughts that I think toward you says the Lord thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. When we begin to perceive God in the same way in which he perceives us, there is an agreement in the spirit that brings us to a deeper level of intimacy and understanding with him. This new level of intimacy causes us to seek him with a full heart of assurance coming boldly into his presence rather than shrinking back in fear and intimidation. Look at the next two verses from Jeremiah 29, verses 12 and 13. It says, Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Key number two, it is God's desire to open your eyes to your personal kingdom path. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 and 19. Listen to this apostolic prayer that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling? What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? Listen to a testimony. This author's Bible school teacher said, it's not in God's best interest to keep it a secret from you. And that statement, he said, changed his outlook. Each of us has been created to play a particular role that has been uniquely designed according to our personality, gifting, innate abilities and talents, the ones we possess, as well as the many experiences, whether good or bad, that we've picked up along the way. It is only as we willingly enter into the role God has designed for us that we are fully able to enter into the discovery of all he has created us to be. The more in sync we are with the person God created us to be, the smoother our life will be. Everything God creates has a purpose. When he created you, he had a definite purpose in mind that is related to his purposes in the earth 
as we see in the following scripture. In Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5, he says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. We may not be called to be prophets to the nations, but just as God knew Jeremiah before he formed him in the womb, he knew you and me as well. He had a role already ordained for Jeremiah, and he has a role already ordained for you and for me. The question is, are we living the role that God designed for us in particular, or are we lost and wandering souls who are still looking and searching for what life is all about and coming up empty? Here's a quote. It has been said, the real test of man is not when he plays the role he wants for himself, but when he plays the role destiny has for him. And that was said by Vaclav Havel, president of the Czech Republic. Key number three, we must have a genuine born-again experience. We must be courageous and ask ourselves with frank honesty, are our steps ordered by the heavenly realm or by our natural understanding? And yep, you guessed it. That is going to be our discussion question for key number three. Are our steps ordered by the heavenly realm or by our natural understanding? Just as each of us has been born of a natural birth, that brought us into this world, there is a spiritual birth God desires for us, a birth that is designed to bring us into the unseen beauty and wonder of the eternal realm where God resides, the kingdom of heaven. Once we are spiritually born or born again, the Holy Spirit comes to live within us to reveal to our natural senses the great mystery of the eternal Godhead and all of the glory of the Father. We are given the mind of Christ or the divine nature of God to see into this invisible realm. Thus, our journey into the unforeseen begins. John chapter 3 verse 3 Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. Now, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation. Nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. A genuine born-again experience includes being fully converted. Matthew chapter 18 verses 2 and 3. Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter in. As wonderful and as adventurous as this path may be, many never find it because they are unwilling to forsake all and become like little children. To be fully converted, we must embrace the cross. At the entrance is the cross, which we must pick up and carry. As we do, we're enlightened to all that exists on the path. 
Matthew chapter 10 verses 38 and 39 says, And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. A genuine born-again experience demands repentance. There are many paths to spirituality, but there is only one path that leads to eternal life in heaven with our Heavenly Father. It is the path less traveled. The only way to discover it is through Jesus Christ and adhering to the words that came from him as he began his ministry in Galilee. He came preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repentance is to change the way we think about something. Again, repentance is to change the way we think about everything. When we adjust our thoughts to God's thinking, it will produce a change in the way we act. Just as Philip the evangelist told the Ethiopian eunuch concerning believing with our whole heart, the same applies to us. Acts chapter 8 verse 37. Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may, that is, be baptized. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. What is true repentance? Well, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19 says, Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription, The Lord knows those who are His. And everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. True repentance causes us to turn towards God wholeheartedly and to turn away from wickedness. God is not interested in just a piece of our heart. He wants the whole heart. When we turn to God with our whole heart, it will change the way we think. We must always bear in mind God's thoughts and ways are much higher than ours. God's thoughts causes us to change the way we think. It's a long obedience in the same direction. It is separation from all that is ungodly. It's a lifestyle of practicing righteousness. It is a godly sorrow for our sin. True repentance will continually open the eyes of your understanding to this adventurous path that is hidden to so many. The eyes of your understanding will be open to the invisible path that lies before you. And I want to interject here that Revelation Proverbs chapter 1 verse 23 tells us that God reveals himself to the people who will receive and embrace his rebuke and turn and repent. Repentance is always connected to revelation. Do you want more revelation from God? Do you want more of a view of who God truly is? Then understand the revelation, repentant, the revelation of repentance. Hallelujah. Repentance brings revelation. Repentance brings revelation. Repentance brings increased revelation. Here's a diagram illustrating the process as we journey towards our final destination in God. Bear in mind, it is simply a general synopsis of our uh, pilgrimage by this author. We are all individuals before God and experience His dealings in various personalized ways and sometimes throughout our uh, walk with the Lord. So in this journey, we'll stop 
start at the bottom. God, who is rich in mercy, saves me. He fills me with faith, hope, love, and vision. I am now walking in repentance. I'm doing good. First love is going strong. I made it at this point, but I'm disillusioned. Is it really worth it? And this comes after the feeling of being invincible. Help, I'm being attacked by trials and tribulation. Fear and loss of vision and purpose appear. I don't have the motivation to go on. I've lost my first love. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 12 through 15. The challenge, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 31 through 39. Then a major decision time to wait on God and get restored or, or begin to walk in the flesh. And you can read more about that in Isaiah 40, 31 and Galatians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Hallelujah! I accepted God's way of restoration. God begins making straight paths for my feet. I now understand how Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 3 works. I'm going strong now. And so this is a common experience in the Christian life. This chart is valuable and you will receive great insight as you look up the scriptures and follow along with the chart. Ask God to give you insight and revelation. God saves us and fills us with an inexpressible joy that results in his rich mercy and grace flowing freely into our lives. We begin to walk in faith, hope, and love as newfound vision and purpose take root in our lives. Our hearts are filled with repentance as we re surrender to godly kingdom authority, which produces a sense of invincibility as the strength of God just pours into us. And our first love is going strong. We saw that on the chart. As the newness wears off, Satan steps up his attack as we are hit with trials and hardships. He knows those opportune moments of weakness in our lives. Some fall away at this point. Others get wounded and disillusioned and wonder, is it really worth it? Fear and loss of vision appear, and we have very little motivation to move forward. Major decision time is next. We must now decide either to wait on God and get restored, or to walk in the carnality of our mind rather than pursuing the invisible path by faith. We are challenged to lift up the hands that hang down and make straight paths for our feet so that which has been wounded doesn't get further wounded and cause a spirit of bitterness to take over. So those who have prepared themselves by staying in fellowship and the word go through this process much easier. Those who submit to the process by accepting God's way, receive healing as they make straight paths for their feet and are going strong once again. Keep in mind that this, all, this is all a general synopsis of how the process works. We're all different. We're all individuals before God, and he works with us as individuals. Finally, we must continually resist the devil and his influences while submitting our souls to God if we are to be kingdom-minded people who live and reign on this invisible path. 
because God yearns jealously toward us. He gives us more grace or more supernatural ability for the journey when we humble ourselves by submitting to him. God bless you as you journey forward and discover the wonders and blessings he has prepared for you along the way. Let's look at some questions. Do you see yourself as a pilgrim traveling through this life? If so, how does your life reflect it? Or how should it be reflected? 1 Peter chapter 1, and we'll look at verse 1 and verse 11. To the pilgrims of the dispersion, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. Again, do you see yourself as a pilgrim traveling through this life? If so, how does your life reflect it, or how should it be reflected? Our next question, what were some of the false perceptions of God you had prior to salvation? And where do you see yourself on the diagram that we looked at, the journey process? Why do you say that? I've enjoyed going through this portion of the workbook with you. Uh, and I'll see you in the next video. Did you enjoy this portion of the workbook? Would you like to go on with me? in these lessons. Leave a comment down below. God bless you.